Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Designer Dave, and I am incredibly ill. In order to get a video done, I thought what I would do is use one of my old presentations that I used to give when I was training new designers at uh, some game studios. It's basically the very basics of game design. These were for junior designers who had never really understood game design. So I called the series Game Design 101. This is part one of four that I completed. I might continue with the part five and six but generally it's just to get people into game design and interested in what game design is. So, let's begin. What is a game designer? There are many famous game designers. Uh, we have uh, Gary Gygax, who worked on Dungeons & Dragons. I consider him like the original game designer for some reason, even though there's been board games and things like that long before him. Uh, Ken Levine is uh, one of my favorites. He did the Bioshock series, System Shock, and, you know, Thief. There's, of course, Shigeru Miyamoto, who's associated with Mario, and then there's the creator of Shadow of the Colossus, Fumito Ueda. I hope I'm saying that right, because I really liked Shadow of the Colossus. These are generally known as game designers. I tried to pick a wide range of things. Um, if I were redoing this, I'd probably put in a board game guy or two. Based on what I know about game design, uh, these are my personal definitions. You may have your own, but this is how I help people understand what I do as a game designer. So a game designer is someone that can translate real and fictional experiences into gameplay. In the case of Dungeons and Dragons, he's taking the fantasy realm, the, the realm of the books of the, the Lord of the Rings, and transferring it into something where everyone can play a character in that world. In Bioshock, you're a very specific person, but you're transferred to another world. Again, fantasy. Um, Mario, again. Shadow of the Colossus, again. All fantasy worlds <clears throat> where you get to experience fictional worlds and do crazy things. But there are also aspects of the real world in those games. So in Shadow of the Colossus, you're riding a horse. In Bioshock, you're exploring an underwater, an underwater setting. In Dungeons & Dragons, there's many things that you do that are related to the real real world, such as interacting with other other people, conversations you can have, going to a bar, <laughs> which is the traditional starting place for any Dungeons & Dragons game. And in addition to that, <clears throat> you can predict the value of those gameplay experiences. And that's the important part of game design that many people miss. Everyone thinks that just having an idea is basically being a game designer. That's not true at all. You have to know how those gameplay experiences are going to come out. You have to translate those gameplay experiences into something that the player can experience and enjoy. And if you can't do both of those things, then you're not succeeding as a game designer. And just as an addendum, there are also many games that imitate the real world. So, for example, the GTA series is about what if you were a car thief? And there are sports games, so you can pretend to be a, a football player or a hockey player, so on. Real and fictional experiences into gameplay, and predict the value of those experiences. So let's, let's go into understanding game genres. Basically, I break it down pretty simply. You've got your real world experiences, and you've got your fictional experiences. Real world experiences are things like sports, uh, soccer, football, hunting, Olympics, life, jobs, police, firemen, flying, military, disaster. Military is probably the most popular of all of those, Call of Duty and all that, but there are a lot of sports games as well. In terms of fictional experiences, generally it only breaks down into two categories. Uh, high fantasy, like Tolkien and Conan, and science fiction, like Star Trek, post-apocalypse, spaceships, zombies. That, that seems like a, you know, like a dichotomy, but there are other uh, things, but they would tend to get classified into general fantasy instead of high fantasy. I guess one, one that I would add is like historical simulation, but that would go into real world experiences as, as well as like a, so example, Rome Total War would fall into military real world. Don't get too hung up on these two uh, distinctions. They're just there to help people understand the two basic areas. You're either doing something, you're either imitating the real or you're trying to create something in a fictional setting. Let's look at the genres of game the traditional genres of games that we're all familiar with. You've got your action games like uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, or uh, Street Fighter 2 would be a fighter. 
but that would fall under the action genre because it's all about the action, the moment to moment. So platforming games, fighting games, to me those are subgenres, but you can split them into their own genres if you like. Adventure games like uh, Myst is the classic one. Zork, of course, came out before that, but these are the traditional exploration and generally involve some elements of, uh, of, of puzzles and stuff. Uh, you get your role-playing games, you get your JRPGs, like Final Fantasy VII, and then you've got Western RPGs uh, like Dragon Age Origins, we won't speak of the others. Um, shooters like Doom, and basically the majority of games these days. Simulation games like uh, the old FA-18 Hornet, <clears throat> that was my first simulator. And, uh, you know, SimCity would fall under that category of simulation. L let's throw sports in there. <laughs> and uh, strategy games like Civilization. These categories aren't completely distinct. There are elements of simulation and civilization, if you want to put it that way. There's, of course, em elements of strategy and Final Fantasy. But these are sort of the big um, six genres that everyone understands. And now... Nowadays, there's been all sorts of, like, break-off genres. So action games, sort of... I mean, platformers have been around a very long time. Like, you know, Super Mario and Sonic are both platformers. I just toss them into the action category because, to me, action is, like, you're constantly doing something. Whereas, you know, an adventure game is more about exploration. Role-playing games are more about building your character up and a story. Shooters are more about literally just shooting things. But all of these have subgenres, which we'll get to. Oh, strategy artillery, my my favorite old strategy game. So these are the classic genres. So let's look at uh, some modern games. We've got uh, Resident Evil Four. You know what? This is a this is an old presentation, so these <laughs> these are a little bit dated, but that's okay. So we've got Resident Evil Four, which tends to bridge genres. So you'll see that. Uh, there are elements of action and there are elements of shooting in Resident Evil 4. And, um, yeah, a little bit of adventure in there. Uh, Diablo 3, which bridges the action RPG genres. The point of this being that most modern games sort of hit one or two genres or take elements from another genre and add it into a classic genre. You got your Mass Effect 2, which is your another RPG. This is an RPG shooter with some elements of strategy. Uh, Warcraft 3 bridged the genre of the real-time strategy, plus it has RPG elements. And you got your Call of Duty 4, which is, you would think is a classic shooter, but of course it's bridging the uh, aspect of simulation by trying to somewhat stay realistic to the real world. Not really, but you know, that's sort of the goal. So, now that we have genres sort of understood, let's look at uh, systems and mechanics. Now the, again, these are my definitions. You don't have to uh, follow these exactly, but for people who have no experience in game design, these these can be useful for sort of defining how they approach uh, these things. What is a gameplay system? Well, a gameplay system is the realization of transforming real or fictional activities into gameplay. And here's some examples. You, you can take the crafting system from uh, World of Warcraft. This is the questing system what is that from? So basically, any system that is self-contained. So your crafting system, your combat system, your quest system. 90% of games have a combat system. And that's why combat design is one of those things that's very popular. Social hooks on Facebook games, those are examples of a system. And then, you know, everyone's dreaded is the monetization system. This is old school League of Legends here. But basically purchasing skins and how that transaction takes place and how you get the money. All of that's part of their monetization system, how they monetize their game. So generally a system is all of the mechanics that go into a system. So what is a mechanic? A gameplay mechanic is a component of a gameplay system. Again, my definitions don't have to follow them. Let's look at some examples of gameplay mechanics. So there's the reload mechanic in Gears of War. If you reload at just the right moment and you hit the sweet spot, you get uh, instant reload. That's a really cool mechanic. It's part of their combat system. It is a really smart addition. I haven't seen it in any other games. I wonder if they patented it or something. Answering your question, Mass Effect. That's a conversation. That's the mechanic of answering the question is part of the conversation system. And in RPGs, when you devalue the goods after you make a purchase, that's a mechanic. 
uh, the monetary system of an RPG. So you can see that the way that I've broken it down, the system is the overlying system, like the combat system, the movement system, the navigation system of any game. The mechanics are the individual components that make up that system. I find this to be a very useful way to define these things so that it's easy for people to understand. Let's look at predicting the value of gameplay experiences. So what is an experience? How do you become good at predicting the value of gameplay experiences? Well, you play games. <laughs> you have to play a lot of games. This is probably the most important aspect of becoming a game designer that people sort of, I don't want to say overlook, but undervalue. But it's important that when you play those games, you analyze the games. You have to understand what makes that game good, and more importantly, you have to understand when you don't like something, why did I not like this? Is it a personal problem? For example, if you don't like sports games and you play a sports game and you just hate everything about it, that's not helpful. That's not gonna grow you as a game designer. But if you play a sports game and you're like, well, I don't like this sports game, I find that the, the way that they line up the shot for kicking is incredibly difficult. If they had done this instead, with an overhead view on the kick so you could choose the direction of the ball when, you, when the impact is about to occur because you can freeze the, the rest of the game because it's a corner kick, then that's helpful because it helps you come up with new ideas for how to fix the problem. And that's the most important thing you can do when you're analyzing a game. It's not good enough to go, oh, this game sucks. Everything about this game sucks. Blah. That doesn't help. You don't learn anything by doing that. You just develop an opinion. But if you can analyze why that particular thing irritates you and come up with solutions that you think would fix it that helps you grow as a game designer and the last thing you can do to become better at predicting the value of gameplay experiences is to make games so how do you become good at game design in general one number one study experiences that interest you it sounds obvious i guess but that just means reading books watching movies if you like sports play sports go fishing, ride horses, all of these things were things that, uh, for example, Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, when he talks about Zelda, he said that riding a horse and stuff influenced his design decisions on the game. And that's important because if you're translating a real world experience into a game, even if it's a fictional experience, trying to do those things yourself can really change how you design it. So for example, if you wanted to make a a superior fantasy game with like extremely in-depth sword fighting. I would go, nowadays we have this revitalization effort for sword fighting techniques, and you can go and actually spar with like people who know real world, or not modern, but ancient sword fighting techniques, and it's like a completely different thing. Like these, these techniques, I, I've watched videos on YouTube of it, no games have done that yet, at least that I've seen. And so that would be a great way to inform what sort of mechanics you would use in a sword play combat system. If you're going to tell stories, you want to read lots of books, watch lots of movies. If you're going to do a fighting game, you probably want to play a lot of fighting games. But in addition to that, learning a martial art would be a really good way to increase your knowledge of what would go into a combat system in a fighting game. And play every type of game. Um, experiences change based on whether you're playing on a PC or a console or handheld, all of these things can inform how to create gameplay systems and how to create individual mechanics. For example, if you're doing an RPG system where you're buying and selling goods, <clears throat> that's like an example mechanic, you're buying and selling stuff, completely different on a mobile phone, a smartphone versus a Nintendo DS versus a PC. All three would have completely different inputs for the player. So it's important to play all of those different types of things so that you can make more informed decisions about creating input systems for them. I need to get this the Nintendo Switch. I haven't been able to get my hands on one yet. Even if I don't end up working on a game for the, con the console again, which is a distinct possibility, it's pretty important to be able to understand that experience so that if someone asks me a question about it, I can inform them. If you're designing for this console, then you need to do this when you're doing the input. Or you can tap the screen in this case, but what if they're playing on the TV? And then you need a sub-menu that comes up on the Switch's screen and so on. Like, I don't know any of that. I just made that up. Don't, don't buy into that. But try to play every genre of game. Play board games. Board games do really cool things, especially now there's like a renaissance of board games that 
you know, is going on, has been going on for some time now, wherein people are doing really cool mechanics, betrayal mechanics and things like that, or betrayal systems, that totally change the way that, that those games are played. To my knowledge, no one has done a betrayal system in a video game yet, like, quite like that, quite like the board games have done. And card games, if you ever want to make a CCG, you have to play card games. But also, card games are one of the purest forms of design. If you can get your hands on one, I recommend getting a compendium, like a really thick book full of all of the Magic the Gathering cards. Because if you're ever stuck for ideas, I can promise you they've come up with something based loosely on whatever idea you're interested in, in card form for Magic the Gathering. And it's just a really great way to like find things that you can put into your game that you, were, you weren't thinking of. I can tell you Rob Pardo, for example, had that on his desk and he would constantly go through it whenever he was looking for new abilities to add into Warcraft 3. Very helpful when you're looking for new ideas. And then the last thing, understand every aspect of game development. And when I say that, I mean all this. <laughs> if I could design a program for someone to become the ultimate game designer, they would start in quality assurance because that's where you test games constantly you look at every aspect of what could go wrong in a game. You come up with, sometimes, depends on the QA studio. But at Blizzard, for example, you can submit ideas for how to improve things. Yeah, and that was, uh, for a long time, that was, uh, as Matt Morris would put it, uh, Blizzard's best kept secret <clears throat> was that the quality assurance department would always inform the game dev teams about like what was good and what was not. And, you know, that's a good thing to have, especially if everyone in the QA department loves games and they're listened to and they feel good about their cont contributions. That can be a really good experience. Everyone should try to do programming. <clears throat> I'm a terrible programmer. I'm the first to admit it. I have the logic down, but I cannot get the syntax, and so it screws me up all the time. Yeah, I think if I devoted more time to it, I could probably get better, but the most I've done for any, for any released game is uh, scripting, which is not the same thing. Um, I mean, it's close, but it's not really. So I would get good at programming, try some art. <clears throat> I'm the worst artist in the world, but I can do some stick figures and face drawings and things like that, just because I practiced it over and over. They're not good. I'm not going to put them into a game. I will always have to purchase artists' uh, work to put into my game. And you should learn some of the basics of art, like what makes for good art and what makes for bad art. There's some art critic books that are good to read. Um, production. You have to know how to do scheduling, you have to know how everyone's work comes together. This is a really important part of making a game. Even if you're just a game designer, you have to know that when you design something, the there's going to be programming, there's going to be art, there's going to be all those things coming together that have to work to make that design happen. And a really complicated system obviously will start with a lot of bugs and has to go through quality assurance. So knowing how those four disciplines work and work together can help you make decisions about game design when it comes to if I make this system too complex then it can push the schedule out really far because there's a lot of game designers who get into designing games and they're like I want it this way it has to be this way and they didn't do it the way I wanted it to so it sucks well that's primarily a byproduct of not having the development time or not having enough programmers or not having enough artists to make some particular game design happen. And so if you're more informed about how those disciplines work, then you can design with your team's specific abilities in mind, and thus you can design the system better for that, which means you don't get into a situation where your design is poorly executed, and thus makes you look bad, makes your team look bad, makes everyone look bad. And marketing, you have to be these days you have to be, everyone has to be a marketer. I have to be a marketer because now I'm like, now I'm a, a brand. Every game designer is their own brand. I can't say I like it very much. I, I'm trying to make the best of it. And you need to too. You need to start developing your brand. You are a game designer who specializes in X, Y, and Z, and you're really good at this and you're really good at that. You need to know those things about yourself so that you can sell yourself to other people to get good contracts. So how do you become really good at game design? So these are my super hot pro tips from 18 years of experience making game design. Number one, divorce emotion from design. What? What I'm saying is you got to learn to kill your babies. If you're, if you start on a design and it's not going well and it looks like it's not going to happen because you don't have the artists or the programmers are like, uh, 
that seems crazy. Like, you gotta, that system's gonna die. That mechanic's gonna die. Let it go. Find something else. Look for some other area that you can contribute to in terms of your uh, game's production time. Or just simply scale back. Make everything a lot simpler. If people don't understand your game design, it's not gonna get executed. And so sometimes you just have to kill something that's out of control. And you can't be upset about it. You can't get angry at anyone about it because you think that they could have done it. It's just not cool. It's going to make it so that the next time you, you try to <laughs> contribute something, the next time you want a game system done, those people aren't going to really be on board. And that will kill anything you do. Unless you're doing it yourself. Um, accept questions as questions. There's a lot of game designers in the industry, generally junior to mid mid game designers, who get upset when they're asked a question about their game design. You know, sometimes people just don't understand something and they need it explained. It's not an insult. And going, if you just read the game design document, you'd understand. It's not good enough. You need to be able to explain every part of your game system, every mechanic of your game system, in detail, succinctly, so that anyone can understand them. And that's why I have a general rule that for my game design documents are three pages or less. Ideally, they're one page. Beyond that, I have visual uh, components, like a mock-up, and I also have an Excel sheet that has all the data. So I separate those things so that if someone's reading just the gameplay system, they can see the breakdown of the mechanics that go into it, and the gameplay loop is explained. I'm gonna do a whole thing on game design documentation at some point in the future, so we'll get to that. But in the meantime, just remember that people are asking you a question not to defy your authority or anything, which is ridiculous anyways because you're part of a team, but they're asking questions because they genuinely don't understand. And that means that you haven't done a good enough job explaining yet. Even if you think they're dense, remember, they're not inside your head. You need to help them get inside your head so that they can see how the gameplay system is going to work. Um, number three, argue logically. I, this is part of divorcing the emotion from your games. Always argue from fact and always go from A to B so that there's no question about how you're getting to the solution or why you're doing something. Because there'll, there'll be a point mid-development where people will throw their hands up in the air and go, why are we even doing this gameplay system? Why do we even need a fishing system in our in our MMORPG? And then it's like, well, there's downtime, it's very zen, lots of people like fishing systems in, in RPGs. It's a good way to get fish. There's no other way to get fish in the world unless we want to just throw that on a vendor, which I think people would see as lazy. Argue logically, and you might not get your way immediately, but the reasonable people will calm down and go, okay, that makes sense, you're right. The unreasonable people may still be upset, but if you give them time, they'll come around. Especially if they see the system begin to get implemented and they actually uh, experience it and start to enjoy it. And then listen carefully. This is probably the most important thing you can do as a game designer in any studio. Listen carefully, not just to people who are complaining to you, but walk around, watch people playing any game system that you've done or worked on. Listen to what they have to say to each other and just sort of watch them play. And like, that's the best way to learn. And when I was doing level design for Stranger's Wrath, we had a couple of uh, people come into the studio who were fans of the studio and I just watched, uh, I think they were, they must have been like eight years old. I just watched them play our game. And I had like three pages of notes from their playthrough because they got confused by this and that. And we did a, a, a couple redesigns on it that really smoothed out the game. Um, based on that. Just being able to watch people interact with the system, that can give you loads and loads of ways to improve it. And listening to people's comments about it, if you're ignoring them, yeah, you're in trouble. <laughs> don't do that. You gotta listen, because people don't complain just to complain. They're complaining for a reason, and you have to find that reason. So divorce your emotion from the design, listen carefully, argue logically, accept the questions as questions, and try to answer them to the best of your ability. And if you can't answer them, don't get frustrated. Go, uh, hmm, you're right, I, I need to think about this more, and let me get you an answer uh, by tomorrow, and follow through with that. And sometimes a system's just not going to work out, and when you learn that, you have to be able to kill it. Let's move on. Never stop playing games. This is the, the best advice I could give um, to any game designer. There's this tendency I've noticed in the industry. Anything above, like, design lead, I've noticed this. Design directors in particular. I don't want to call anyone out, but they stop playing games, and uh, their design becomes dated, and they make poor decisions. EA producers are the classic example of this. I'll call them out because they suck. They don't know what the fuck they're doing anymore. 
they have like a list of things that they force into games like turret missions and things like that that don't make any sense in modern games and they can't recognize it because they don't play games so you need to try new genres if a new genre comes out even if you're like oh, I don't think I'd like MOBAs go play freaking MOBAs for a year go play them because it's a new genre and you have to understand why people love it like League of Legends is a phenomenon if you're not if you haven't played League of Legends because oh I wouldn't like League of Legends I, I prefer Dota 2 you're you're screwing up you're gonna be a bad game designer <laughs> sorry to say but if something's a phenomenon you have to play it if uh, if a new thing comes out that's super hyped you have to play it like I played No Man's Sky for hours and hours and hours because it was all procedurally generated and everyone was talking about it it turned out to be not great but there are grains of greatness in it and I could see a new game coming out that capitalizes on that that could really go gangbusters. Mass Effect Andromeda, for example, was supposed to have elements of No Man's Sky in it in terms of procedural generation. But when No Man's Sky came out, they backed away from it because of its reception. But what they should have done was played it and looked at what went right and what went wrong and then adapted Mass Effect Andromeda for those things because it could have been amazing instead of a giant piece of garbage. Uh, try playing old games differently. What? Go back to like Super Mario Brothers, the, <laughs> the original, and just uh, do it. Do it timed. See how fast you can get through it. Like, um, yeah, that's like a whole thing now is um, speed runs. Try to do a speed run on something that you've never thought of, like Portal One. You'll find a whole new aspect of the game that you didn't get the first time you played it by trying to play it in a new and different way, and it can give you a lot of really cool ideas for new mechanics and systems. Play the obscure. What? So there's this whole thing of indie games now. And it was, um, I, I had posted a, a blog post about how I thought indie games were kind of garbage because I'd played like 10 or 20 of them and they were all kind of kind of garbage. This was years ago. And then Jonathan Blow is like, oh yeah? And he sends me a, a preview copy of uh, Braid. And it blew my mind. I'm like, holy shit. Just because there's like layers and layers of garbage on top doesn't mean that there isn't gems in there and you have to try and find them. And sometimes even a even a garbage game can have an element of it that's really cool or a mechanic in it that was a really good idea but just poorly executed. And so you have to play all these things at least one day a week on one of those indie game sites that has like a like a congregate and just play through some of them because you never know you might run into the next um, blockbuster idea in there. I'm not saying steal other people's ideas. All work is derivative, all stories are derivative, all games are derivative of something. There is no such thing as a wholesale new idea. So you may as well get lots of ideas and then be able to take from different games all these cool ideas and put them together to make something truly beautiful. Lastly, understand your role as a game designer. What the heck are you talking about? Your role as a game designer is to translate these experiences into the gameplay systems and mechanics. So you need to be able to explain your decisions so that anyone can understand what you're trying to do. If you can't explain it, then they can't implement it correctly. I mean, that really comes down to good documentation. More importantly, in a one-to-one -one conversation, you need to be able to explain these things. Know when you don't know. This is a big problem in the game industry. If you don't know something, you have to be able to admit that you don't know something. You go, I don't know, I need to do some research on that. That's an important thing to be able to say. And believe it or not, admitting you don't know something will earn you more respect than pretending you know something and then walking away as though you had completed the conversation. Because people know when you don't know. If they are asking the question, they know something you don't. And that means they have information that you need. And that means you need to admit that you don't know so that you can get that information. And if you can't admit that, then you are obstinate. You are in the way. You are blocking the success of your own game. Don't be that guy. I hate that guy. Um, admit your mistakes immediately. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait until it's like <laughs> three months down the line. Like you've, you've put this uh, game design together. You, you, you put in the system. You, you explain what you can to the programmers. They're like, hmm. Not sure about this and uh w like a month in you realize oh this isn't going to work because of x y and z and you just let you sit on it instead of admitting to it you are royally screwing up at that point your job as a game designer is to go whoa, whoa, whoa okay this isn't going to work we need to change this to have a solution on hand or at the very least say stop production on this element right now this system isn't going to work as designed i need x amount of time one week one day whatever it takes to redesign it to make sure that it it's better 
Now, if you do this all the time, people will lose trust in you. But when you've made a mistake, don't let it sit there and fester because it's just going to keep going down the line. And it's going to create all these branching problems. If a game is built on broken systems and you realize it and you don't say something, you're not being a good game designer. But accept ideas from others. Everyone can have good ideas. That doesn't mean they're going to be a good game designer. That doesn't mean they're hijacking the design at all. It just means they had a good idea. And if you can translate that into a good gameplay system or mechanic, do it. Give them credit too. Like, oh, I got this idea from so-and-so. It's really good. Uh, this is how I put it into the game, or this is how I think it could be added into the game. That earns you respect. If you don't accept ideas from others, that earns you disdain. No one wants to work with someone who just wants to, like, cradle their baby and hide it from everyone. Those are the worst game designers, and I've run into many in the industry, where they just try to hide and protect everything, and they obfuscate all their design under these layers of terrible language. No one can understand their game design documents. No one can understand why they implemented their systems. These are terrible game designers that you never want to work with. They bring down entire games all by themselves. All right. So just a recap, we, what we covered, uh, we went over the definition of what a game designer is, we went into some game genres and some subgenres and how those genres are getting mixed now in the modern era. I talked about systems and what they, how gameplay systems are larger components of a game and how mechanics are components of those gameplay systems. And I talked about some good game design principles and how you can be a better game designer. So now there's homework. What? Yeah, there's some homework here. Sorry. So, <clears throat> what I want you to do, pick a game that you love, and I want you to play it again. And I want you to write down, define, and describe at least three game systems from that game. You have to, do, you have to figure out what the game systems are in that game and write them out. If you can do them all for that game, even better. And then for each system, I want you to write down at least one mechanic. Now, now remember what my examples were, so let's say that there's a combat system. What's the mechanic of a combat system? Well, let's let's look at Street Fighter 2. You got your punch, you got your kick. Those are mechanics. You've got your throws, you've got your interrupts, you've got your special powers. I'm sure I missed something, but uh, those are mechanics of the of the combat system of Street Fighter 2, for example. And then for each system, I want you to write down what you like about it and what you dislike about it, if anything, and how you would improve it if you dislike it. So I hope that this was interesting and informative for everyone. I'm sorry that uh, I can't do the camera today. I look like garbage. I'm very sick. If you like this, let me know. Uh, please like and subscribe. If you're interested in learning more about game design, go to my Patreon. Or if just seeing more videos like this one, you can support me on Patreon. May your geekdom grow and flourish.